In our last episode, we left Cecil B. DeMille in his office, wondering if his first film would be his last. Production had gone well, but someone in the quiet suburb of Hollywood wanted it to fail. Someone had deliberately scraped many feet of film in the editing room. Each evening, Cecil got on his horse and rode to his rented house in the Coenga Pass. Who was trying to shut down the Squaw Man? Was it the Edison Trust, still trying to control production? Trying to stop the first feature film to be made in Hollywood? There had been a pitched battle, both in court and on the streets, between Thomas Edison's Motion Picture Trust and independent filmmakers, led by Carl Lemley. The courts had finally decided against the trust, but Jesse Lasky had taken the precaution of paying them off. Cecil wondered if someone had infiltrated his company. Looking at the photograph of the first day's shooting, Cecil noticed that one man in the photograph was no longer with the company, a lab technician he had fired. Cecil made a few calls, and the incidents stopped. Cecil had moved from his apartment on Lexington Avenue to the Coenga Pass Cottage to accommodate a pet that needed more space. When a tame wolf named Simla came to Cecil from a newspaper ad, Cecil found his first real friend in Hollywood. The Squaw Man casting call brought unique talents to the Lasky Company. Joseph Singleton came from Australia. Guillermo Callas came from Mexico and later directed films about indigenous Mexican tribes. Likewise, Noble Johnson would direct many race films while acting in Hollywood features such as King Kong and the Ghostbreakers. Lillian St. Cyr had been appearing in films as Princess Red Wing for five years already, but she also worked as an accuracy consultant for directors such as D.W. Griffith. Winifred Kingston was a British stage actress who had just acted in Soldiers of Fortune in Cuba with Dustin Farnham, the first film for both of them. Farnham had signed with Lasky on the condition that Winifred be cast in the film. Winifred was a trooper, changing her costumes in the horse stalls without complaint, and her romance with the star continued. Filming ended on a bright, sunny day three weeks after it had begun. Jesse Lasky was feverishly selling the Squaw Man, state by state. Cecil and film editor Mamie Wagner were assembling scene upon scene from the Squaw Man working without sleep for 87 hours. A few days later, the Squaw Man was ready to be projected onto a screen for the first time. The main title flashed on the screen. The editing looked good and the audience was responding. And then, something odd began to happen. It looked to Cecil as if the film were crawling up the screen. The projectionist was not able to correct the problem. Something was seriously wrong with the film. If Cecil B. DeMille could not correct the problem and honor the state contracts, He wouldn't be breaking into the movies. The movies would be breaking him. 